Thanks for watching episode 200 of Angry Video Game Nerd. But before we get into the show, you know we all love horror here at Cinemasker, so I wanted to introduce you to Rusty Quill and RQ Network. Home to some of the largest podcasts in the world, the RQ Network includes original programming like the Magnus Archives and awesome horror anthology series dripping in the supernatural unknown. There's also Rusty Quill Gaming, an actual play tabletop RPG podcast with comedians, improvisers, and writers, along with a curated collection of some of the best audio dramas around, like We're Alive, an award-winning audio theater show about the survivors of a zombie apocalypse told over decades. I especially enjoyed what I listened to of the Magnus Archives, as it not only scratches a particular itch for things that go bump in the night, but also spiderwebs out into a larger mystery as the series goes on, which kept me hooked. With any of the Rusty Quill podcasts, you know you're getting something of high quality because they've won tons of awards, including the prestigious British Fantasy Awards for Best Audio, Audioverse Awards including Best Audio Play, Best Improvised Production, Best Writing, and the list goes on. Their shows have even been praised by Games Radar, The New York Times, Financial Times, The Verge, Cosmopolitan, and even Nintendo Power. Okay, maybe I made that last one up. To learn more about Rusty Quill, whether it be the RQ Network or Rusty Quill Original Shows, head on over to RustyQuill.com or click the link below in the description. And now, on to the episode. What were they thinking? I'm dead fucking serious. Fuck! Fuck! <laughs> I do this? How can I live up to the massive duty that has fallen upon me? My destiny has emerged and the ultimate reckoning has drawn near. I must not fail. I must look the demon in the face. Not you, you piece of shit. I'm talking this. This piece of paper is what will propel me into my final encounter with my arch nemesis, the unholy of asses, the shit from the pit, the nightmare in six colors, the rainbow of death, the laughing, joking numbnuts, L.J.N. I'm about to embark on a mission to come to terms with LJN once and for all. As you can see here on my wall of LJN kills, I've already eliminated several of these foul, catastrophic fuck nuggets. But now is the time to take care of the rest. And this document here was sent to me from LJN. They're still around? Well, not exactly. It's complicated. So before I tell you what's at stake here, let's go into a little background. First of all, who are and who were LJN? We all know their distinct brand of games, the same way you'd recognize the specific smell of your dog's farts. You take one ghastly whiff and you know exactly where it came from. From your dog's anus. But LJN was like the master of disguise. As a kid, when I rented these games from the video store, say, Back to the Future or Roger Rabbit, nothing seemed immediately wrong. The graphics usually seemed nice, and they all had a playability factor. But the further you'd go, the worse it would get. Like in the final stage of Back to the Future, when you're driving the DeLorean, if you lose, you start back at the beginning of the game, no matter how many continues you have. What bullshit. The NES library had plenty worse games by other publishers, so LGN was definitely not the bottom of the turd totem pole, but that made their crimes even more detestable, because they tricked you into thinking the games were good, especially when so many of them were based on well-known franchises. With other shitty games, you wouldn't waste as much of your time. You'd realize it's shitty right away and turn it off. 
But LJN had that sneaky style to rope you in. But even though they had a distinct brand, their games were actually made by several different development companies, so LJN was only a publisher. In a sense, they were the colon and the developers were the anus. The companies, just to name a few, were Beam Software, Atlas, and the one that developed perhaps the worst one, Bill and Ted, was called Rocket Science. Wow, damn, I'm glad they didn't actually go into Rocket Science. The one that's the most shocking to know of is Rare, who made Beetlejuice, Nightmare on Elm Street, and a few others. They're probably better known for non-LJN games like Battletoads, and would eventually have a partnership with Nintendo on Killer Instinct and Donkey Kong Country. I would have never guessed such awesome games came from a company that had anything to do with LJN. So even though LJN was the publisher, their games are still called LJN games in the same way that the 2014 Ninja Turtles movie was called a Michael Bay movie, even though he produced it and did not direct. But to answer the question, who exactly were LJN, we'd have to trace it all the way back to its founder, a guy named Jack Friedman. He started LJN as a toy company in 1970, and I've heard he named it after his employer, Norman J. Lewis, reversing his initials to LJN. That was until it officially became laughing, joking numbnuts. At first, LJN only made toys before branching into video games. In the 80s, I remember playing these toys, like the wrestling figures. So I had nothing but positive memories there. Guess they should have stuck with toys. So anyway, in 85, MCA bought LJN, but then in 90, sold it to Acclaim, who in 95 dissolved LJN, even though they used the name once again in 2000. As for Jack Friedman, in 90, he formed Toy Headquarters, THQ, eventually leaving and forming Jack's Pacific. And sad to say, Jack passed away in 2010. Rest in peace. So basically, the rights to LJN have been all over the place and lately have existed in sort of a phantom limbo. But this document from the current owners certifies me as the sole inheritance of the name LJN. How could this happen to me? With great power comes great responsibility. And with me as the head of LJN, I will undo the wrongs of the past and prove that there is gold at the end of this rainbow. I will be remaking the LJN game library, starting with Back to the Future, using the same limitations they had back then, except this time it'll be done right. So let me introduce to you my game designer, Sam. How you doing, Sam? Hey, nerd, I'm doing great. I'm really excited to be working on this. What are you calling me from? Uh, it's uh, Commodore 64. How is that even? It's not important. Listen, Universal have a strict deadline on this, so it has to be ready in time for the Christmas shopping season. So um, the actors, likenesses, the music, do we have you know everything signed off? Uh, yeah, working on it, but it's almost there. So we want this to be more of a fun action experience, you know, racing around on the skateboard, Lots of enemies, characters from the movies. Yeah, sounds good. I'll get to work and report back soon. Thanks, Sam. That new game is going to be good. Better be. While he's working on that, I'm going to get down to business and review the rest of the LJN library. It's like cleaning the cat piss stain on the back of the litter box. One of these days, you're just going to have to do it. But how many games are we talking about here? The LJN stamp appeared primarily on three consoles, the NES, Game Boy, and Super Nintendo, with a few lone poop nuggets. For reviewing purposes, I'll be grouping them into categories, movie-based games, sports games, Marvel games, wrestling games, and miscellaneous. In total, I've counted 67 games to the best of my research, including one game console, the LJN Video Art, which thankfully I've already covered. The joystick moves the cursor about. To draw, or should I say to scribble around like a blind golden lion tamarin on speed, you hold down the button. And when you're pressing down and rocking the joystick around like this, it squeaks. Oh, oh, that's awful. Yeah, that thing sucked. But anyway, the criteria is that every game must have the LJN logo on the box or the cartridge, with the exception of two that only have LJN on the copyright screen. These are just going to be samplings. Every LJN game will be shown. And after I finally acknowledge them all, I can move on with my life. 
first, let's talk about the movie-based games. Now, fortunately, I've already covered most of them. Ah, memories. Cue mandatory milestone episode number flashback sequence. Well, let me be honest with you about this one. Oh boy, I hate this game. And if you touch an enemy, you fly in the opposite direction. You can't get close enough to really attack anybody. So every time you get hit near a pit, you're basically dead. Now this is kind of fun though, you get to punch people. Yeah. The only thing that's really annoying is that it takes so long to charge that punch. Oh. You know what? It isn't fun. You know, it just isn't at all. It's just a pain in the fucking ass. What are those guys doing with that window anyway? And why are those giant bees always coming out? Give me a break. And what the fuck is Marty doing when he gets killed? It looks like he's having some kind of seizure. I mean, I guess I'd have a seizure too if there were bees and hula hoop girls and all this weird shit coming at me. I mean, just leave me alone. I'm trying to collect clocks. In this timeline, when Biff brought the Sports Almanac to 1955, it somehow created a world full of piranha plants, killer clouds, and evil Martys. You're supposed to collect 30 items and bring them all back to their rightful places and times. You find the items behind locked doors. To unlock the doors, you need to find the keys, which are found by killing random enemies. But the keys don't sit still. They fly off the screen the second they appear. Love the way the stones keep missing the zombies because they go in this nice arc that flies over them. I love how smooth the camera angles are. The overall design, the astroturf floors, just ingenious. That's the best game over screen I ever saw. That's brilliant, right? You and your friends are dead. Game over. But here comes a game like Friday the 13th that just cuts the bullshit, shows some balls, comes flat out and says, you're fucking dead. And your friends too. Beautiful. You're dead. Your friends are dead. Your family's dead. Your fucking pets are being skinned alive. Your mom's a fucking whore. You suck at life. The whole world hates you. You're going to hell. Live with it. Game over. So you play as some dude who has some serious balls because he punches snakes right in the fucking face. Punch him! Uh, uh, smack him around! Assholes! Goddamn fucking spiders! Spiders! Punch him! Snakes! You want some too? Could the villains be any more stock? Like, we had this creepy game about Freddy. What kind of creepy characters could we add? Well, how about bats, ghosts, spiders, skeletons, and Frankensteins for the kitties? Could it be any more uncreative than that? Like, why don't they just add some witches, black cats, and flying jack-o'-lanterns? They should have just called the game Boo! Haunted House. All you're doing here is killing time until the game decides you can go back to the boat. Then you can sail around again until you hit something else. It's sort of like RPG style, where you run into battles at random. But here, it's always the same undersea scenario. Nothing changes. The whole thing is just powering up so you can fight Jaws. That's all there is to the game. What a waste of time. So, we're throwing bombs on jellyfish. Seriously? Then you come to the boss. Now who is this guy? He's taller than you, and aren't you supposed to be the Terminator? Arnold fucking Schwarzenegger? But trying to shoot the truck and pay attention to all the other stuff at the same time is really frustrating. Okay, well, what was the point? Why couldn't you just collect the bombs and put them where they go? I can only imagine what they were thinking. Duh, you put these bombs in this thing? Alright, what next? Uh, how about you take them back out and you put them somewhere else? It's treating us like a fucking dog. Go get the ball, bring it back, go get it again. <laughs> fucking dickwads. Next we have Terminator 2 on Game Boy. The first stage seems simple enough until you reach the laser barrier at the end. So naturally, you walk back to the left trying to figure out what to do. Then you find out you can shoot these towers. So I take them all down, and still, we have a barrier. Turns out, you gotta shoot the towers in order, from tallest to shortest. What a load of random bullshit! At the end of the second stage, you have to reprogram the Terminator. Okay, is this how John Connor did it? I never thought this part of the story would make it into the game. Basically, you have to mend the wires together so the electric currents go the right way. But you have a time limit, and it always seems to end right when you start to figure out what you're doing. 
You can't even pause the game to look at it because the screen goes blank. What is that good for? It's like he's a marionette or he's being hanged by an invisible rope. Like, holy lord, that is some fuck right there. Look at him go! Woo! 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 Oh man, a head-on collision with a truck and a motorcycle. And the truck explodes. This is the absolute worst driving stage I have ever played. Just wow, it takes the cake. Gameplay is just as mindless as ever. Move the cursor around the screen and shoot everything in sight. Fighting the boss is the most redundant thing of all. It takes more bullets than anything you'll ever see. All you do is shoot, shoot, shoot. Oh, but there was also Terminator 2 Arcade on Game Boy, which I said very little about. But that's because there's nothing to say. Look at it. If I heard that, I'd think it was an Atari game. What's the point of taking an arcade and watering it down to Game Boy? I guess you can take it on the school bus, to the mall, to the arcade. Then there's Beetlejuice on NES. So, how does Beetlejuice hold up? Let's turn on the juice and see what shakes loose. Damn! Ah! Fuck! Shit! Nope, no, not fun. Game sucks. That's all you need to know. Say that to someone in a sentence. To get a cloud to move, I had to get a skeleton to shoot a fireball at a beehive. When did that ever happen in the movie? And we're talking about a movie that's batshit insane. But I didn't talk about Beetlejuice on Game Boy, based on the cartoon. Uh-oh, the ghost got in the washing machine. They're fucking shit up. Gotta fight the clothes and the sheet ghost, which is, um, a sheet with a ghost inside. So that's the main goal. You have to fight all the ghosts, which is the opposite of what Beetlejuice normally does. Doesn't he haunt a house, not unhaunt it? What next, are the Ghostbusters the ones letting the ghosts in? There's a bunch of crappy mini-games. Here the idea is, who can make the freakiest face by tapping directions on the D-pad? That's a new one. Then there's a game where you connect pipes. Wow, does this look like fun? No, it isn't. Even Mario and Luigi, who were plumbers, never had to bother with this type of shit. But the worst is the stairs. At random, they'll flatten and send you sliding back down. Motherfuckers. And it keeps happening over and over with no pattern or predictability. Ah, uh, you fuck. You think they overthought this a little? How about just a cutscene showing the phone booth spiraling into a time warp? You have to hit one of the pink skulls. One of them takes your coins, the other one makes the last digit appear. So it's a 50% chance you'll get the right one. That is some supreme bullshit. How do you find this bait? You wanna know? Guess what? By jumping into things. You wanna play in Bill and Ted game? Well, here you go. Go jumping around in the fucking bushes and fences. That'll keep you busy. Have fun. <laughs> But if you want more fun, you should try out Bill and Ted on Game Boy. Even though I'm trying to be sarcastic, it actually is more fun, though very basic. It's sort of an old school arcade style thing where you just go around collecting orbs and dodging a bunch of Abe Lincolns. There's almost nothing to say, but in this case, that's a good thing. Because this is such a sharp contrast to the NES version. I can't think of any other example where a Game Boy version is far superior. Another game I already did was Alien 3 on NES. You can never predict when the aliens are going to pop out. It requires split-second reaction time. I don't know, thing from Adam's family dragging a dildo? Just another addition in this game's museum of anomalies. Ripley's Believe It or Go Fuck Yourself. But wait, there's more. Alien 3 on Game Boy turns Ripley into a stick figure. Or maybe it's an alien, I don't know. So all I did in this game was walk around like an idiot. There's ladders everywhere, but you can't go up any. Found some alien eggs, touched them, and died. Lots of people walking around, can't talk to them or anything. No hints, no direction, no map. This belongs to a certain genre, strategy guide seller games. But Alien 3 fared a little better on the Super Nintendo. The graphics are good, the music is tense, and the control is smooth. You have a variety of weapons. You can select different missions, like save prisoners or destroy alien eggs. Though the enemies come a little too often, and I wish there was a map. 
Something like Super Metroid would have helped. There's a blueprint system that you find on the terminals on the wall, but anytime you're lost, you have to make it back over there. Kind of like stopping at a gas station before GPS was invented. The best part is the game over voice. Game over, man. Which was from Aliens, not Alien 3, but who cares? Well, here's one that I missed in my Arnold Schwarzenegger Games episode, True Lies. It's one of my favorites of his, not just for the action, but also the humor. The game retains some of that humor. Like when you shoot an innocent civilian, your assistant, the Tom Arnold character, gives you shit about it. Also, when you die, he says things like, you only have one life left, as if he's witnessing you die and resurrect. But wait, what do you do when a civilian's blocking the path? He won't move! But when you fail, this happens. Now that's what you call a game over. It really does emphasize the magnitude of the defeat. Boom! You lost, motherfucker! Unfortunately, the game is very monotonous. Even though the scenery changes from the mansion, the mall, the park, it's all the same top-down, run-around-and-shoot crap. When you think of the movie, you remember the bathroom fight, the horse-on-the-roof chase, the bridge scene, the Jamie Lee Curtis strip dance. I wonder how that would have worked. It does have the plane finale, but it's just an automatic cutscene. Oh, and of course there had to be a Game Boy version. Here, Arnold looks like a pill from Dr. Mario with a gun. It's the same thing, shoot bad guys, but avoid civilians. And anytime you shoot, you're guaranteed to get shot back. It's better to just walk past them. All in all, it's the same as the Super Nintendo version, just shittier. You're fired. LJN even made games based on movies you might not remember, like Warlock. The graphics and animation are pretty nice. The gameplay is basic enough, run to the right, blast everything in sight. It's fine for a bit, till you realize how resilient these enemies are. Stay down, you zombie fuck! Stay down! Then you run into these archers. Die, you fuck bugger! And every time you get hit, you get knocked back half a screen. Look how long it takes to beat this guy! Die! 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 Oh my god, when are they gonna die? When are they gonna die? Oh my god. Then these gargoyles keep coming at me, and they take just as long to kill. Every enemy is like a mini-boss battle. The control is clumsy, you can't attack and move at the same time. When you die, it sends you back to the title screen. Instead of simply continuing, you have to go to Preparations. That brings up a menu with the password option. You enter the password and then wait through a cutscene with a book. And being a magic wizard and all, I can't see how water kills you. And it's not clear how I'm supposed to make this jump anyway. Hey, I got a magic trick. LJN even made a game based on the 95 swashbuckling adventure, Cutthroat Island, which, according to the Guinness World Records as of 2012, was the biggest box office failure of all time. Oh, and then add LJN. It's the perfect storm. So the first level is okay. It's just a dumb beat-em-up game with cartoonish graphics. The animation is good. There's a variety of sword swipes and rolls you can perform. It's not bad, really until you get to the next level. Now you're in a wooden cart ramming into enemies. You just mow them all down. Seems simple enough, but if you hit a rock or a tree, you die instantly. There's no death animation. It just fades to black and restarts the stage. So if you blink, you might not even notice what happened. Like when I hit this guy, I had no idea how I lost, but it turns out you need to avoid him. But how the hell was I supposed to know that? You run over everyone else, why not him? All right, let's check on Sam. Hey, Sam, how's the game coming? Yeah, it's, it's pretty good, you know, all things considered. I mean, the, the NES is a little harder to program for than I expected, but, you know, it's, it's coming together. You can see it. Well, hey, why don't you try it out for yourself? It's an early build, but I think it's promising. Quick delivery. All right. Okay, it's a good start. I mean, we need some kind of power-ups here. 
So can we put Hill Valley in the background there? Have some time travel, get the DeLorean up to 88? Yeah, we got time. Maybe have the holographic shark. Oh, totally, as a bus fight. Did we get all the actors to sign off yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah well, 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 no, we're working on it. It's, it's almost there. It's a good start. But yeah, there's a lot left to do. Well, let's get back to work. I'll check in on you again soon. It's gonna be good. It's gonna be good.